My name is Diane Fayon. My husband, Bill, has frontotemporal degeneration, or FTD. Bill was diagnosed in November of 2009, but of course we knew something was wrong two to three years at least before that. So I first noticed that Bill would forget how to get certain places, and he had always been so good at navigating, but we went on an, a, a trip for our anniversary and we went to the beach and it was a little tricky to get into the back entrance of where we were staying in an apartment and he kept forgetting that and that was so unlike him and I also noticed during that trip that he was very interested in watching CNN and he had never watched CNN before so those two things were, seemed very random and different so that was one of the first memories I have of knowing something's wrong we used to take three-mile walks every day when the weather was fine enough to do that. And he became obsessed with any dogs he would see along our route or little children. And, but he would act silly, almost childlike himself. And he, it was out of the ordinary for him to be overly friendly in that way. So looking back, I realized that his familiarity with strangers was because of degeneration of the frontal lobe and the lack of social filters. There were many incidences where I thought something is wrong and they just kept adding up. We had a vegetable garden that was his thing to do the vegetable gardens and I did the flower gardening and we had problems with rabbits. So we went to the store to get fencing and he bought horse fencing. Horse fencing has holes this big. That's not going to work. You have to get fencing for a rabbit. And that was one of the incidences where I said, something's really wrong. This is a smart man. Why is he buying fencing for horses when he's trying to keep rabbits out of the garden? So Bill never thought anything was wrong with him. And I would bring up these issues and he'd say he'd work on them, but really he didn't think anything was wrong with him. I was concerned about Bill for two years and then I was alarmed for two years where things were happening and I thought something's really wrong with you but I didn't say anything to anyone and no one was saying anything to me we would go to social events and Bill would say something that was off topic with the conversation and I was thinking did you see that did you hear that what are you thinking about that but no one said anything and I didn't say anything because you have all these thoughts. Oh, he's overstressed. Oh, he's just getting older. Oh, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just imagining that something's wrong. You have all these doubts. I thought about calling his boss. So he was a high school science teacher. And in the fall of 2008, I thought, I've, I've got to find out if something's happening at school. How is he managing teaching when I'm seeing all these things that I'm alarmed? But I didn't because I thought, what wife calls her husband's boss and says, have you noticed something's wrong with my husband? You don't do that. So he didn't say anything. And finally in March of 2009, I got a voicemail at work from his boss and said, can you come in and talk to me? And I knew, I just knew that finally things were going to shift. And I was actually relieved to finally talk to someone. So the first thing was to get him to go to our, our GP, who he saw Bill. He gave him a physical, he asked him questions, and he said, Bill, nothing is wrong with you. Just go home and listen to your wife. I was furious and so anxious. And I said, isn't there a test? And he said, well, we can do a blood test. I'm like, let's do a blood test. Because I'm thinking Lyme disease or there's got to be something. I'm not thinking dementia. So I said, let's do a blood test. So they, he took blood and then he rummaged in a drawer and he pulled out a piece of paper. He said, oh, here's an Alzheimer's test. I'll ask you these questions. So we asked Bill all these questions. Well, of course, he, he got them all right because he didn't have Alzheimer's. And so we left and Bill was elated and I was just crushed because 
I knew something was wrong. Other people now are coming forward and saying something is wrong. So I went to um, the nurse of the school and she offered, she actually offered to help me find a good neurologist. So she found a neurologist and the neurologist said, I don't know what's wrong with him. So this is crushing again. There's, there's no answer. But they say, well, go take this test. It's a four to five hour test. It was a, a, psych, a psychological, neurological test. So we went into, came here to Philadelphia and took the test. And the person who reviewed it said, well, he did so well in this area, but not so well in this area. We don't know what it means, but something is wrong. So that at least there was some kind of validation that way. So they suggested a PET scan and my insurance wouldn't cover it. They wouldn't allow it. Oh, well, he's not severe enough. He's not bad enough. So then they did an MRI and the MRI said possibly FTD, but it's all just possible. But it ruled out tumors because at that time, we're thinking, okay, now maybe it's tumors, and so it's not that. So finally, I think it was the first neurologist who said, you should go to the um, University of Penn Hospital and see Dr. Grossman. So we, we finally got to the Penn FTD Center and saw Dr. Grossman, and he um, diagnosed him with FTD. And I have to say, I laughed out loud. I was so relieved that it finally had a name. So I felt relieved to get a diagnosis. That doesn't mean there aren't other emotions going on. And basically our lives imploded. Everything that we had known just shattered and everything changed with this diagnosis and finding out that it's terminal and there is no cure. They don't know what the cause is. His isn't genetic as far as they can tell. So there's a sadness. Uh, I, I carry that sadness with me all the time and you just learn how to hold it because it's not going to go away. After we got the diagnosis, we went often to the FTD center until recently and I liked going because for a lot of reasons. One is they validated everything I was seeing at home and they shared the information with me. So I got to see his MRI scans. It's very weird to look at your computer and see scans of your husband's brain, but it also was very comforting in a way because I could say, there it is, I see it. I see what's causing the problem right there. They also got me in touch with the FTD support group that's on the main line that meets once a month. And I started going in March of 2010 and I've been going ever since. And it's a lifeline for me. Bill is one of the people with FTD that has something called hyperorality. And when he was still living at home, it started and he ate, he ate rocks that I had on a plant and cracked a tooth and I had to have a tooth extracted. He ate so much salt, he had to go to the ER. He ate dog food, he ate cat food, he ate uncooked rice. The list goes on and on. He ate puzzle pieces. I actually have a picture of a bowl of milk with puzzle pieces in it because he thought it was cereal. So he wasn't safe at home without us watching him all the time. We had to fashion a folding screen with chains and padlocks to keep him out of the kitchen. And we also put child locks on the kitchen cabinets. So we locked him out of the kitchen, but there were other things in the house and we were constantly one step behind him. We thought we'd get everything and then he would find something else. And it was like dealing with a toddler. I'd see him with something in his mouth and I'd say, what's in your mouth? Open up, open up, let me see what's in your mouth. And it might be a paper clip he found or something small. So that was a big factor in placing him in a facility because I felt like I couldn't keep him safe. It's not an easy decision we started out with respite. He got to go there for a week and I got a break. After the week, they called me and said, do you want to pick him up or do you want him to stay another week? And I said, let's let him stay another week. I need another week. And then at the end of that week, they called and said, 
do you want him another week or do you want to take him home? No, I think I need another week. So we did another week. And after that, they called and said, do you want him to stay a week, one last week, or do you want to take him home? Let's go one more week. We went one more week. So that's four weeks. And they said, now you have to make a decision. Do you want him to go home or do you want him to stay? And I said, he needs to stay. I knew it was time. And I had all the support in my family. And I've never felt guilty about it. I thought I would. People thought I would. And I haven't because it's the right thing. And it's been the right thing for my family. It's been the right thing for me. And most of all, it's been the right place for Bill. After Bill was diagnosed, I had so many people say, you've got to take care of yourself. And I heard it so much, I'm like, oh, I know, I know. It's hard to figure out how to take care of yourself. It's such an individualized thing. And so each person, after they get the diagnosis, they do need to do that. And they have to figure out, what is it that I need the most? For some people, it's journaling. I had no desire to sit and write. It's not my thing. I tried a ceramics class. That was fun, but it wasn't for me. But at one of the conferences, I heard about the end of life. And I knew that Bill was going to reach the point that I would have to be physically getting him in and out of bed. So one of the things I did to take care of, of me was to hire a personal trainer. And I started exercising. And it did reach the point before Bill went into the facility right before that I had to help him get in and out of bed. I had to shower him. I had to, he started wearing Depends. I had to do all of that. And I was so glad that I had started the personal training years before because it helped me to be stronger because Bill's a, a strong man and I needed that, my own strength to be able to help him physically. So I think that's an important message for people when they get the diagnosis is to not feel guilty doing things for them. At first, my only time away from him was at the grocery store. And I'd go to the grocery store and feel elated that I was on my own. That's not enough. You need to take care of yourself by doing things that really feed you because it's a long journey and you need to be looking after your own well-being. You've all heard the phrase, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. My husband made a barbecue sauce recipe, and every Christmas he would make batches of this and give people pint and quart mason jars of this, and people always said, oh, Bill, this is so good. You should, you should market it. You should sell it. A year after the diagnosis, my sons and I started to make barbecue sauce, and it's called Bill's Best BBQ. And we're raising awareness of FTD one bottle at a time. We want people to learn about FTD by reading the label on our jars. And whenever we can, we give a percentage of our profits to AFTD. I want to help people, and I am so glad they're looking for a cure because I don't want any other families to go through what we've been through. We've been through so much. I know that I'm a stronger person because of it, but I just wish I could have become stronger another way. Didn't want it to be FTD. The staff at the FTD Center are so kind and understanding and helpful. I feel like I can call them at any moment with questions, and I have, or send emails. And they've helped me n maneuver and navigate this uncharted territory. And I'm just grateful that they're there. They're another lifeline for me.